Hi, my name is Drew Moore, and today I've got Brian Basting and Michael Reginelli here in our Bloomington, Illinois office, and we're going to hash out the July USDA WASDE report that was just released here at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Um, currently, we've got corn uh, versus the December down about 40 cents, uh, November soybeans down 51 cents, and um, December wheat down 29 cents. So uh, first question for you, Brian, what was the big takeaway from the report today for, for corn and, and uh, wheat as well? Starting on the corn side of things, Drew, we're looking at um, unchanged on the U.S. corn demand for 22-23. Now, they did make a small change in 21-22. They reduced the feed residual number by 25 million bushel, and that was reflected with the grain stocks report there at the end of June. So our carry-in supply for 22-23 was increased 25 million bushel. Now, the USDA took into account the slightly in, uh, larger acreage in the harvested category for 22 crop on corn. No change though on yield. So uh, the result was a 45 million bushel increase in production from what it was in June. So the combination of those two, 25 a million bushel higher carry in, 45 a million bushel larger crop, the carry out supply for 22, 23 drew was increased 70 million bushel. Now there's no change in usage there. So uh, really not a big surprise there, but. Uh, perhaps something to watch down the road will be those usage figures for new crop, particularly exports. The reason I say that is because USDA did confirm, Drew, we're looking at a record crop from Brazil, 116 million, top, 116 million tons. That crop is being harvested as we speak and will enter the world pipeline as early as August and really compete with U.S. corn all the way probably through the remainder of calendar year, perhaps all the way into early 23. So a lot more export competition this fall compared to the fall of 21. Otherwise, not much change in corn. We did see Chinese imports unchanged from what they were in June for new crop at 18 million tons. That'll be a key factor to watch down the road. Switching over to wheat, Drew, we're looking at um, some larger crops here domestically in the U.S. compared to June. The soft red winter crop was increased 5% from what it was in June. Now we're looking at some bumper yields for soft red winter in parts of the Midwest. The Eastern Corn Belt looking at some very strong yields of wheat, pretty good quality for the most part. So as a result, the USDA did bump up that soft red crop, as I mentioned, 5% from what it was in June. Virtually no change in hard red winter and not much change in white. Now, on the spring wheat, this is our first survey-based estimate, spring wheat production, 457 million bushels. Now, last year's crop was only 290. So that drought crop last year is in the rearview mirror. Fortunately, and we're looking at a much bigger crop this year. Result was the all wheat crop here in the U.S. is 1781. Uh, that's up about 45 million bushels from what it was in June. So really uh, looking at a competitive environment on the world scene, Drew, uh, USDA did increase the size of the Russian crop, half a million tons from what it was in June to 81.5. I would add, though, that there's some in the trade that think that number is too conservative still. I think that number could edge higher in future reports. We've heard that numbers as high as 86 or perhaps 87 million tons from Russia. Russia wheat exports are unchanged to 40 million tons. Uh, so Ukraine crop was lowered 2 million tons, but exports were left unchanged at 10. I think it's still a very fluid situation, Drew, in terms of the export competition. But USDA did bump up U.S. exports 25 million bushels to 800. That would be about in line with what they were last year. So uh, overall, though, uh, no, no bullish news as such to boost up wheat. Um, but again, we're keeping a close eye on what goes on in that Black Sea region. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate the, uh, the detail. Um, Michael, over to you. What, what are the, your thoughts here post-report on the uh, soy complex? What, what stood out specifically to you? Yeah, um, world numbers weren't terribly exciting. They were down about 800,000 uh, tons, which isn't a huge deal. The market was looking for at least a you know a million ton drop off there. So nothing really substantial to, to write home about there. They did make some adjustments on the U.S. side of the balance sheet. Uh, old crop exports were down 90 million. That has to do with some of the well-documented uh, switching, Chinese cancellations, um, switching to South American, Brazilian origins, uh, cheaper origins. But they did increase domestic demand. So, I mean, crush seed residual were all higher, basically resulted in a uh, 10 million bushel increase to old crop 2122 uh, carryout uh, from 205 to 215. They, uh, they made some adjustments to new crop as well. Um, 
Now, it was two, 280 last month for the carryout for 22.23. They reduced it to 230. Trade was actually looking for something a little less than that, closer to 211. Now, remember, they had to incorporate the June 30th acreage data into these numbers. So the trade knew the carryout was going to fall. Uh, but the USDA is being fairly conservative with their demand estimates. They cut Chinese imports by a million metric tons to 98, from 99 to 98. Uh, they took exports down 65, which would be a similar number to what Brian and Dr. Sean Quiler and ATI's research team are all kind of using today as well. So no changes uh, to the yields, but slightly above expectations would be slightly bearish based on kind of what the general thoughts were heading, heading into this report. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you, Michael. Brian, um, maybe the most important question or the, the question you probably get the most, but you know, tell us about um, you know, the true conditions of the corn and soybean crop right now. What are you, what are you seeing on the field and you know, how does the weather forecast um, stand moving forward? Well, the USDA, Drew, came out on Monday of this week and told us that nationwide, the corn good to excellent ratings were 64%. Last year at this time was 65%. Um, looking over at the bean crop, USDA has good to excellent at 62%. Now it's above last year at this time with only 59%. So uh, really looking at a critical window for corn starting out these next 30 days as mm -hmm. we increase pollination. On average, Drew, from the next two weeks, from July 10th to July 24th, uh, the amount of corn silking increases by about 45%. So you could argue that, that between now and um, at the end of the month, will be 50% uh, of the corn will pollinate in that period. So looking at a critical weather window, I would say right now the corn crop overall, overall their spots, obviously east to west, that are less than ideal. But the corn crop's hanging in there pretty well. It has not been harmed by really excessively high temperatures. Dryness has been a concern, but we got some good rain across uh, some key areas the last week to 10 days. Um, there is some rain forecast this weekend. It's a big wild card. Will it exceed expectations? That would certainly uh, help the crop quite a bit. But overall, Drew, I'd say the corn crop uh, backs up the USDA's estimate there of just about in line with what it was last year. It's a developing story. We've got to wait this out, though, the next 30 days. Beans, best we can say is that it's off to a good start. But as your, as your viewers know, we're looking at the, the month of August is going to make or break beans. But uh, they've gotten some good rains here that have helped uh, some of these beans. I would add one thing, Drew. These rains that we've seen uh, the last week or so may encourage a bit more double cropping beans in some of these northern areas. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Michael, what's uh, the cash market indicating here as we wrap up the 2021-22 marketing year uh, here in the next uh, 45 days? Yeah, it still feels like, in general, uh, there's some coverage needed out there. Uh, I would say both corn and beans. I mean, one of the big things that won't be a shock to anybody is that farmers are fairly disengaged at this point with prices falling to, to the levels that they have. Also, old crop supplies um, and farmer ownership have, have dwindled a little bit. They've had great opportunities to make sales. So while there still is on-farm and farmer ownership out there, it's certainly, you know, um, kind of getting to that last, you know, that la those last percentiles. Um, sure. So without a huge influx of farmer stocks available to still buy in to kind of bridge that gap to new crop, I, I still feel like there is coverage needed out there, both on the domestic bean side and really the export side, but also the, the corn side of the ledger as well. So the other thing, too, is particularly in the central and western belts, elevators don't have a lot of ownership left to, left to move either. They've had great opportunities to, to make sales, you know, in rail, river, and processor truck markets um, kind of throughout the year. So there's not a lot of uh, commercial inventory available either. So if you need to bridge that gap, it feels like the cash markets still have some August SEP coverage that are gonna be needed out there that should theoretically be supportive to the basis in, in a number of markets. Um, you know, but there also could be some, some left hooks to that too. You know, as the new wheat crop comes off, as Brian mentioned, looks pretty good. Will we see you know, higher inclusions of wheat feeding in the rations? Will corn in some markets, you know, in Western markets domestically get so, basis get so high that we actually start seeing run rates slow down? So there are questions that can solve this a little bit, but in general, it still feels like we're in a, we're, we're in a well-supported cash market for, for the foreseeable future. Sure, okay, good, good to hear. Um, Brian, you know, on the, on the global side of the wheat ledger, you know, what are you seeing? Um, any new happenings in, in Ukraine that the, the viewers would like to hear about? 
The biggest unknown, of course, Drew, is, is what will be the fate, if you will, of this new crop uh, production in Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. in terms of exports. Um, the USDA did leave their projection of exports for Ukraine for 22-23 unchanged today at 10 million tons. Now, they did lower the old crop, or pardon me, they did lower the production by 2 million tons, but they basically reduced feed usage and, and uh, cut the carry out. So will those ports be able, at full strength throughout this 22-23 crop year in terms of being able to uh, ship grain, ship wheat uh, from Ukraine? That's a big unknown at this point. Uh, I think we have to rec recognize that that's a fluid situation. I would add, Drew, that Russia remains an aggressive exporter. Uh, record exports are forecast for Russia for 22-23. And if this crop does increase some in Russia, perhaps it'll even have more capability. But Ukraine, Drew, is, is a big wild card. Um, I would add to, to your viewers one other thing on the world scene. It's quite dry in Argentina. Um, Argentina is a very large exporter of wheat, uh, primarily, well, it is the hard wheat that they export. Um, sure. USDA did lower their crop today just a tad, half a million tons. But um, it's something that will be evolving over the next few months uh, because we do need a, a large southern hemisphere crop, not only from Australia, which looks very good at the moment, but we'll need a large crop from Argentina. So that'll be something to keep an eye on. Sure, sure. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Michael, last question for you. Um, you know, the macro markets have been a little bit more of a driver of ags, or at least it's kind of seemed that way uh, as of late with U.S. dollar index, you know, running to 52-week highs and, um, you know, running over uh, 108 uh, points, and then you've you've also um, you know had the, uh, the the you know crude oils um, you know a risk off right now, and, and all commodities kind of seem to be a risk off at the current moment. Um, you know, does that does that seem to be the case? Is that is that a fair fair statement? And um, you know, what do you what do you see uh, as we move forward in terms of uh, the macro markets influencing eggs? Yeah, uh, totally fair. Um, you know, the U.S. dollar, I believe, is riding around the highest levels that we've seen in decades, you know, almost 20 years at this point. So, you know, the U.S. dollar skyrocketed. We've seen a lot of pressure come in from the outside markets. You know, I was looking at charts from June 8th to July 8th, basically a 30-day period. You know, natural gas was down 45%, you know, and so we've referenced that as that's, that's like taking corn from $8 to 440 or taking wheat from $10 to 550 So when you look at it through that lens, although it feels like the ag side's been beat up, there's a lot of alternative commodities who've seen much steeper losses and much more significant pressure if you kind of view it through that lens. So, and it spans out, right? Like uh, gold's at, you know, 10 month lows, silver's at two year lows, crude's hover near multi month lows as of this morning, down five, six bucks. So, that there is pressure across space. The one reaction to that that we've seen is we've seen net, uh, the net funds, uh, you know, the specs cut their positions pretty dramatically. I mean, if you look at the net spec corn position from two months ago, it's roughly half today of what it was their net long beans are that that position's down roughly 40 percent from where it was two months ago so during this sell-off we have seen outside money significantly reduce their exposure to the commodity space too which tells you at some point if we do level out and some of the unknowns that you know brian and and i have talked about today do begin to kind of turn their head and fundamentals become a true driver kind of for the grain and oil seed space once again they do have money that's sidelined that they could step back in and, and we could see a bit of a recovery if, if the fundamentals in the market justifies it. Sure, that makes sense. Well, thank you both again for your, your time today and your valuable information. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing everybody uh, next time here after the August USD report. Have a great day.